Yeah, for one. Quite a few. Yeah. Comes down. This is the Neobooks call for Monday, November 11, 2024, uh, in Canada and the Commonwealth. Today was Remembrance Day. So there were traffic jams and other sorts of things because they had some ceremonies and people in uniform outside during the day. Uh, they do a nice job of honoring their veterans here. Um, as I think is true in Britain and lots of other places. Uh, the red poppy pins are characteristic of it because those are sort of fundraisers for veterans. Um, and we just, in, in Friedrich's brain, we had a, what did we talk about? We were talking about the platforms needed for um, <laughs> for sense-making, which, you know, we've never talked about before. Um, that was irony. Uh, and uh, do you want to summarize a little bit of where we were? Uh, we were all over the place as usual. I mean, we got into politics. We got into the fact that we'll have to make uh, platforms that are, less public and more uh, small networks in the current political climate <laughs> with uh, better privacy control. Um, but otherwise, we were very much speaking about the need for better, yeah, better sense-making platforms, including, we spoke a lot about what does it mean to vote on, on the platform, I mean, uh, when, you know, most, most unit of knowledge contain quite a few positions, uh, posts in general. Uh, we spoke about, what did we speak about? We spoke, we had several plugs for meeting face-to-face, -face, which is actually quite beneficial. We did not coordinate our wardrobes today and yet look. <laughs> um, but it's Especially great. like the, the dual view, the, the long way shot, the nearby shot, it's, it's yeah. nice. The long shot is Marc Antoine's laptop over there next to a big screen. So he's looking up at the really big screen. I'm looking down here at this camera. So we look like we're totally distracted. Uh, that's cool. I find I have better view on the big screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, anybody with a Neobooks catch up or uh, thought to, to start things? Uh, I've been using Obsidian a whole bunch. Uh, Wendy, I'll go to you in just a sec. I've been using Obsidian a whole bunch and pushing markdown files off to GitHub and then posting finished things over to Substack, Medium, and LinkedIn, and then putting putting links to each of those back in the original post on Massive Wiki on, on, on GitHub, um, just because I like to make my life a little harder. But it's been fun. And I, I haven't gone into the topic of explaining neobooks in that method yet. I mean, I've got some incipient starter points, but I haven't uh, I haven't gone to do that, but that, that's high on my list of priorities for uh, where to go next, because I think that to, to give an example of how neobooks might work in this, uh, in this space might really help us all uh, with us figuring out what we mean and recruiting other people and things like that. I'd like to pick up on a comment you just made a moment about going to small private groups for sense making. And I'd like to give a counterpoint to that. Um, in that, uh, you know, Jerry, I think I, I haven't been, you know, I don't track everybody's activity, but the, there was one that you did put on LinkedIn, which generated a fair amount of interest. And I've often said, you know, why, why isn't uh, open global mindset open minded about its work? It's all in closed spaces. And, and the problem with that is that it doesn't make it public, but actually more importantly, it doesn't do something which I think is far more important, which is, I mean, I just got somebody sent, you know, just sent me a bunch of diatribe about, you know, that I've got Trump derangement syndrome, all those sort of tropes that, you know, go round and round. But the thing is, if, if you don't, if you just, if you don't respond to them or give some counterpoint to it, then it's very, you know, you're just enabling um, the alt-right uh, enterprise. So I would I would counter that. And actually, there was one woman, I've forgotten her second name, it was Pia, who had a Forbes article about Trump. And I thought, what a load of crap. You know, that was my reaction. My and gut reaction, I said, okay, right, do I want to waste my time saying something that I disagree with, some small point about something? So I just cut, post the article, put it in the perplexity AI, and I said, can you affirm and refute these, uh, this article? And actually, it did a, it did a lot. It did a very quick, and there was a lot I disagreed with. There were several things I didn't, but it was pretty good, actually. 
So I, 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 I posted back and, and actually suggested that, you know, maybe doing AI peer review of articles to find out it's not going to be anything like as sophisticated that, uh, you know, uh, Antoine could do, but it provides initial fodder to be able to counter somebody. Um, so, you know, the idea behind it, how can we actually mobilize AI when people are putting crap out there that is completely incorrect? Why can't we have AI instantly giving a reputational score on your crapness? You know? And I don't think that's far, far removed, but, you know, I can't see it happening. Um, but if, it, you know, automatically, but I, I just got another one who just sent me a bunch of crap. And I just went in and I put it in and I got seven great counterpoints. And if I had sat down and sent, spent time, you know, uh, you know, writing, I, I got something very quick and sent it back again. So I'd like to... Uh, uh, you know, counterpoint some of the things that you were saying earlier, thinking, well, how can we do this in such a way that we are organically creating this mycelium of, of, net, of, of nuggets that are uh, emancipation from alt-right propaganda? So that's my, that's my little rant, having just heard. Just, I was just in the process of cutting, pasting something into somebody's response and sending it back to them. Uh, about um, about what they said. Anyway, so I'm mm. a little activated just because it's you know the, the, you know do we allow ourselves to be a little irritated by the fact that you know we have a disinformation pandemic that is uh, you know uh, just just in the you know the cesspool of everyday life. Anyway, there you go. The AI as a mask. Yeah. So um, the, you've opened up many different issues. I think I'll just sort of uh, pick through a couple of them in, in, in different ways. Um, it, it's pretty obvious that a lot of the stuff that Trump says is a lie. And yet a large number, in fact, a dominant number of the people of the United States decided to vote for him. And I don't think they're ignorant of the lies. I don't think they are not don't have enough common sense to be citizens. I don't I don't think a lot of that. I think a few of them, a few of them are really angry or maybe ignorant or I don't know, but I'm not going to I'm not going to posit that. I'm going to say that there was something else. There was something else that weighed more heavily, more heavily than facts. So that they voted really overwhelmingly everywhere. I mean, this was not an election like Reagan or H.W. Bush, which were wipeouts for the Democrats, uh, but it was really bad. And, you know, at this point, uh, conservatives are going to own all four power centers uh, in Washington, which is like crazy making to people like me. But if we don't step outside the game of trying to fact check and prove and, and de debunk and whatever, if we don't step out of that, we are well and truly and royally, I'll say fucked in this case, instead of hosed, because I think it's, I think staying in the same mugs game is part of the problem that half the country said, yeah, you guys don't get it. You got you guys really don't get it. And we need to do some deeper introspection until we get to a point where we start getting it. And I have all kinds of contrary indications of what getting it means and what's going on. And I don't know, but I'm trying to open my brain enough to be permeable to those different points of view. And it's hard, hard as hell. Uh, Rick, you're muted. You know, just to counter that, it's it's. I, I found your argument somewhat reductionist. It's both and and and, and so you know, assuming that you don't. I mean, I I personally believe that we don't know the extent to which people believe or don't believe the big lie. I think there are plenty of people. We haven't done the research, and maybe to find out on the spectrum from complete and utterly delusion to I know he's he's telling a lie, but I'm going to vote for the guy anyway because. I can't stand Harris. I can't stand how this done. Because the alt-right is so much better than the alt-left in smearing people. They are brilliant. The advertising campaign, the money that went into those swing states, all the lies that they did. I mean, they are masters. And if we can't understand how they're outflanking alt-right, uh, alt-right is outflanking alt-left, or doomed because they are marketing savants and they know how to tip the needle just a little bit with lies and not to call out the same. We're not going to call out the lies or the propaganda that was just released on TV ads. I think it's ludicrous. 
So I, I disagree with that. It's both and. We have to consistently call out lies and at the same time find out the extent to which people are completely and utterly delusional and to what extent they know he's a liar, but I'd rather have a psychopath in than, than the Democrats. I am still not on board with your point of view. I didn't expect you to. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't want you to be on the same page. I think yeah. we need diversity of approaches because none one approach is going to be sufficient. It's going to take a broad swath with people being authentic about what their worldviews in. So it's not going to be Jerry's worldview. It's not going to be Rick's worldview. It's going to be a groundswell of different views that can take on the alt-right propaganda machines. And we've grossly underestimated them. And, and that can somehow work together, which is the other thing that alt-right is so great at. It's even, There's a great diversity. It's, it's a weird coalition. The alt-right is also a weird coalition of people with very diverging interests. And they're good at cracking our coalition. coalition. We have to get that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They know how to divide and conquer. They know how to set, they yeah. know how to get Dems fighting and arguing amongst themselves over small minutiae detail. And it doesn't frigging matter. You know, because if they divided us, they've succeeded. They are laser focused on one thing, predominantly negativism and smearing the opposition. It's near terrorism par excellence. It's just smearing people with lies. So we'll disagree to disagree. That's fine. Over to the next person. I've had I've had enough airtime. The the part that I want to back Rick up on is that I think that the segment of the people that actually think he's a psychopath but voted for anyone, I mean but were willing to vote for him, I actually think they are the ones on the far left. The, the independent voters, the people that really supported him, they don't, they believe him. They don't think he's a psychopath. They believe him. I had a very interesting experience this weekend. I'm down in North Carolina and I went to a party and this is a friend, you know, these are friends that I've met through a friend. And I said, you know, how are we with politics? Because I know some of her neighbors are going to be there and they had like mm -hmm. the big Trump flag up there. And she said, I think we're okay, but we don't we don't really know. We don't talk about it. Anyway, I won't go through the whole long story. It turns out the woman with the big Trump flag, super nice woman, ready to help anybody. One of these people that is always there. I mean, anyway, I so I was inside, I was speaking to there was this young woman there, and she she's wearing sweatpants, lingerie on top to dress up the event. And uh we had a really great talk. You know, I usually, you know, enjoy talking to younger people and everything was wonderful. And we talked about the election without talking about the election. Yes. And the interesting point is that it wasn't until later when I was in another conversation with her and her mother and somebody else, this other woman, that I realized, oh shit, she voted for Trump. Now, first she was saying, when I walked into this conversation, well, I had to vote. I mean, I'm a woman. I have to respect that right to vote. So she's all into like, I am woman. I'm going to be responsible. And it wasn't until she said that she lost four friends because of the way she voted that I was like, oh my God, it felt like I was walking in this house of mirrors because you really couldn't tell who was who. Mm. And so again, I mean, this really doesn't go far from what I've been saying from the beginning, because I think if, you know, I read something that I wrote in 2016, I just shared it. And back in 2016, I had written something on Facebook, which was basically, I don't care who you voted for. I don't care if you didn't vote. I, I don't care why you did what you did. I know if I'm connected to you, you have a good heart. At this point, I mean, I, I stand by that because However, I got to this party with these people, all of those people were truly good hearted people. And I'm telling you, some of them, even though we didn't get too much into it, I know from talking to my friend here, when I tell her how much fear there is where I live in Nyack and I talk to her about mass deportations and stuff like that, she doesn't believe it. I just, I mean, she does now because I, I went off on her today because I was, I was visit no, I was visibly upset mm -hmm. because I remember in New York when the schools were locking the doors 
because ice was coming. In her world, that never occurred. It really never occurred. And, you know, until I got her to realize by talking about, you know, the people we know, not people we know, but like how people will like kind of blackmail other people or, oh, you're not going to give me 50% off? You'll be getting a call. She knows some of the things that I've had to deal with with people. So she knows situations. People can turn nasty and evil very, very quickly. And I know I'm rambling right now, but I guess the... the when Rick is talking about how the Republican Party is better at smearing, he's absolutely right because the people that support them are not the way Democrats are. Democrats, well, that goes against our values. We're not doing that. And although I respect that part of them, and I'd like to think I'm that part of them, it's hard to win a game when you're not playing by the same set of rules. So uh, I'll calm down now. Mm, that's really good. I was reading a few political commentaries, quite a few. One one of them was about you know never, never under never underestimate your public's intelligence, but never overestimate overestimate their knowledge. Uh, there's so much that people don't know, and people were googling like somebody looked at Google's uh, on the day of the election. Can I change my vote? Uh, but on the day of the election, a lot of people asking, are tariffs bad? <laughs> uh, a lot of people, I mean, we consume political information. We're political animals. And a lot of people don't, it's not part of their lives. And uh, suddenly they wake up, they have to take a decision and they go with in impressions and intuitions because they haven't researched it. Uh, and, and, and certainly, I think that is one mistake the Democrats do, is assuming people have the background knowledge to understand what they're saying, which is often not the case. But to Rick's point about silos, because that's part of the problem, like this young woman, I really feel like had I been able to speak to her a week earlier, she would have voted differently because she really wanted to understand certain things. And if you're only asking a certain group of people, like my friend, who I'll tell you, she has a great heart, but she never heard any of those things. And I said, that's because you're surrounded by people that would have never told you. They would have, you know, like she said to me, we were arguing over, is Trump an idiot? <laughs> Which, <laughs> he's not smart. He may know how to set people up. He may know how to, no, he, he knows how to market. He knows how to make something look a certain way like most sociopaths do. But he's not really, he can't understand really complex things about how, I don't think he can, which is why they had to do drawings for him. But the point is her whole opinion was based on what her people were telling her. Now, if, I, if I'm convinced that you're the world's biggest liar, no matter what you say, I'm not going to believe you. But if I'm also convinced that they're all out to get you, and I believe mm. they're I'm going to yeah, believe exactly. everything you tell me. Exactly. exactly. I mean, that's, that's virtuous victimhood, and he's a master of it. He used the big line, the insurrection to do that, play that card, the underdog, poor me, what, yada, yada. I mean, he's an he's an emotional savant of playing that game. I couldn't agree with you more. Let me throw two things in the conversation around what Stacey just said. <laughs> um, one is the the right and the far right over the last thirty years have built a beautiful echo chamber where if you're in that media environment, you only hear exactly what they're saying to each other. You do not hear; it does not penetrate. Nobody's subscribing to the alternate points of view that he's a liar or whatever else. You hear like somebody seems to be barking outside the door saying like he's a liar, but really within like Fox and and, and Fox is now one of the mildest forms, unfortunately, but OANN and, and, and all, you know, and, and worse, all the bro podcasts that have really doubled yeah, right, exactly. from the new media, right? Um, they're telling the same story. And if you hear everybody saying the same story, you're like, yeah. So all of these persecutions of Donald Trump they're trumped up. It's, it is, in fact, a witch hunt. You know, there's no and, in there. They should just stop. Why are they doing this to our dude, et cetera, et cetera. But then 
but just riddle me with this for a second. I have a feeling that people, many people on the far right understand that Trump understands modern power better than everybody on the left and everybody in journalism understands modern power. And the things we're saying here sound ignorant to them. They're, they're voting for the dude who mastered old media meets new media meets power, just raw power. And, and we don't get that because we want to go back and say, these people are just stupid. They don't see it. They don't have enough information base. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm like, you know, a whole lot of them want the system broken and see somebody who understands modern power. And I've got to tell you, Kamala Harris getting endorsed by every rock star under the sun and having like expensive big concerts and you know, like endorsements by the elites backfire. Exactly. It's just the exactly. elites. It's just the elites, yeah, exactly. you know, you. So, so half of the stuff Kamala was doing was absolutely backfiring with people who are like, yeah, look, she's running a really brilliant, hardworking, completely old school campaign. And when she said, I don't think I'd do anything different from Biden. Like any hope anybody sort of on the other side had that she might in fact do something dramatically different, which I think Democrats have to do. And I don't know if that means swing more toward the center or swing more toward AOC in the squat. I really don't. I haven't, I have no strong opinions on that yet. Like Bernie, I, I read one of the critiques, one of the articles said Bernie might have won because he actually had substantive shifts in how to run the country. And, and Biden really didn't, but won just by, by a squeaker. Uh, and Kamala really didn't. Kamala ran a completely vanilla, very wonderfully executed old school campaign that the other side was like, that was proof positive that they did not want to vote for her, regardless what the other guy was saying. Because the other guy's lies, they understood, were what light up the media and light up the left and get everybody all dysfunctional and woo, 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 woo. And I have a thought in my brain about like, what, times Trump is just trolling. Times Trump is just trolling on on purpose he's trolling and he's got a side conversation going with his followers that says hey look i'm going to say something incredible right now and tomorrow they're going to disavow me and a week from now they're going to kiss my ring and that's real power and gotta tell you that little pattern has played out oh i don't know two dozen times in the last since 2016 at least if I could just pick up one word, you said power, but I think you have to frame the word power and what type of power you're referring to. If you're talking about sociopathic power, given the principles no, Roy Cohn, no. hold, hold, hold me on. I'm sociopath, I'm like, nope, not on board anymore. So no, that's fine. Power. Okay, that's Social okay, power, but I'm going to say, yeah, that's power, fine. You're making a judgment. Oh, are you damn right I'm making a judgment? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's where we can agree to disagree. That's if, fine. You know, the, the, he, Trump is a master at implementing Roy Cohn's sociopathic principle, three sociopath, he's lived by that. And if you cannot call that sociopathic, I think that's highly problematic. We can agree to disagree on that. I mean, not all use of power is the same. There's different forms of power. You're talking about race, and he knows how to champion sociopathic power. And the beauty of absolute libertarianism is it legitimizes sociopathy. It's it's fantastic. I mean, nowhere else could you be such a, a successful sociopath other than politics. You could not, you couldn't, you can work in the business world. And there are plenty of them there too, but they don't get as far as they can in politics because it's much safer ground. Nice. <laughs> so I've heard the argument from the left, and for those people, I tend to agree that getting Liz Cheney's endorsement was worse than getting the Hollywood elites endorsement. I, I think we're talking about different groups of people as if they're one set and they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, but but each of those endorsements was backfiring while we while the left thought they were like, oh my God, that's so awesome. Look how many ex-members of his administration are endorsing Kamala Harris. That is just unbelievable. And everybody on the side was like, mm, yeah, not, not, not swaying me. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Jose, and then Wendy. Um, Wendy looks first to me on the on the pile, but that's fine. Whatever order uh, you, if you guys want to arm wrestle, you can't. But Mark Antoine and I can. Jose, you read <laughs> first. <laughs> uh, I did. Okay. Watch it. Um, thank you. I'm sorry to say, but I, I don't want to hear this stuff. Um, to me, the con 
the issue that we need to figure out as a species, <laughs> not as Americans or as Democrats or as Republicans, the thing we need to figure out as a species is how do we move from here? Mm. Because this can't keep going this way. They're going to... it. I cannot see elections becoming regular anymore. They're going to get worse rather than better. Right? And so how do we get to a stage where we're focused on the thing that we need to figure out rather than the thing that's being broken because it isn't going to get fixed by itself. And the more attention we have to that, the less we will be able to even see that we need something new, that something different, something better needs to be done. Mm. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Wendy, then Marco Paul. Yeah. Oh, so many things. And I think my ideas here are fleeting. Um, I just see while the election may have been won and someone has said, um, well, has been won um, because someone read, read the tea leaves, <laughs> read the energy and played the power piece. There is so much, and this has also been said, there's so much division within that, that you get division of the division of the division. Um, it, it just fragments. So, you know, you go down the path of civil war, it doesn't have to be much of a futurist to say you can only divide things so so much until you have, a, you know, you, you have no no coherence to be able to, to, to be able to bring anything together, a bit of local coherence, but not being able to get any form of unity above that. And yet we need to have this sort of, you know, we need these different views because there are so many different things going on. It's never one person's set of problems. It's everybody's set of problems, but everybody has separate problems as well. Anyway, coming back to what you were saying, Jose, um, you know, this, and we find it in our groups too. We're not, we're not even agreeing to do, you know, near books in this call. Okay, because we're so <laughs> we're so taken with the problems, and as an observer from outside, you know, I've I've come like I'm part of a regen network, and I'm coming here. And this isn't a complaint at all, because I don't know much about your election. I didn't even watch, and for a week I didn't watch. I mean, I sort of knew who won, and it hurt too much to see it. You know, there was an emotionality that I didn't want to experience, but now I'm sort of dipping into it and trying to understand more. Um, and the, the flow-ons to other people are real. You know, this isn't one country. This is the whole world. And so if we're going to do anything useful, we've got to be able to build use cases around things that are useful. Commonly, everyone's got to have water, okay? Everyone's got to have a place to live, Simple, you know, I don't need a whole lot, but every now and then I want more than I need. <laughs> um, you know, education, well, that's going to change for you guys. Hopefully it won't change so much our end, but it has a flow-on effect. Um, anyway, you know, I, I'm doing work for a regenerative place-based network and I'm interested in understanding just the, your advice on the best way for me to move forwards to, to create a, a network of knowledge that, that is is um, able to be iterated because there's so much that needs to be connected. So if we come back to a neo books thought just for a few minutes, <laughs> I'll leave. And you know, Pete, Pete's not here. Okay, mm -hmm. and it, there are so many of these conversations, and it, I understand why they're happening. But I do stand a bit with Jose to say, you know, if you want to do better, then you've got to figure it out. And there's the brains in places like this to do as much as possible. Were you online? Yeah. Uh, Mark Antoine, then Rick, then me. First, uh, thank you, uh, Jose, for bringing us back to the fact that we need, as I was saying earlier, we need better communication. Uh, this is a failure of communication. What uh, was described, uh, this story you had, sorry, uh, 
about uh, the 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 party it was an excellent like it didn't go through things things didn't go through and we need to have somehow a better shared store of knowledge worldwide not even nationwide worldwide uh, that we can interact with so that way yes it's a and 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 what rick was describing the uh giving the uh, rebuttals well these rebuttals shouldn't be something you pull out of a LLM. ideally they should be something that goes into a knowledge graph that we can all refer to uh and now the question of uh echo chambers is extremely relevant the um how, if we build something that is more knowledge oriented and more uh, allows better reflection, will people come? Uh, and this is why we keep speaking, me and Jack especially, not just about uh, knowledge representation, but knowledge federation. We need to be able to have conversation across community. And, and and refer to what's happening in the other community in a way that's ideally visible by both communities. But that has to be a shared goal. That the, the, the fact of communication has to be a shared goal. And th th there were a lot of people uh, very critical of the fascists on the other side. And what's really the problem, yeah, fascism is a huge problem, but the fact that the willingness to have conversation is not shared by all. I mean, Stacy had a great example of actually wanting, somebody actually wanting to have a conversation, and a few people don't, and that's reality. But it's also true that there's people on our side not engaging, and it's more complicated. But there is an issue with the, um, the medium, uh, the fact that it's so fragmented. There's so many silos, and that's by design. We have to remember that the silos are by design, and that's a power issue. That's a regulation issue. Like when Dr. O speaks about mandatory interoperability, or, or, or not blocking blocking interoperability legally, that is because silos are problematic, and they're a political problem. And that way, we are, I'd love it to be deliberative democracy instead of stupid representative democracy. And then the downside of elections would not matter. That's what I want, but that's not where we are. <laughs> and, and the locuses of power are where they are. And yes, there's new power. I agree totally. And, and it's interesting to see who masters. Like I was thinking Musk was making such a mess of Twitter, but he won his bet again. Uh, he he re-engineered Twitter to be a right-wing provocateur. Yeah. Very successfully. Very successfully. That was a great investment. Um, and he's going, and that will go into profit in, enormously. So we have to engineer, and this is an engineering problem, less siloed communication media against the will of people who want to keep it siloed because it advantages them. That's engineering and political, because it's illegal to go through the silo walls. Uh, so we have to play on all fronts. We have to play within the confines of the laws, and we have to play with the technical, how do we have, uh, how do we build a platform that breaks the silos and enables more nuanced conversation and enables creating this database of rebuttals. Uh, it's a lot. Over, I'll let others speak, but... Uh, after Rick, then me, then Stacy. Yeah, maybe just to dovetail a little bit on what you were just saying, Antoine. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, when I when I'm saying it is this is where the synergy comes in. AI is good at fast thinking, faster than I can gather information. Love it, but on the other hand, this is where slow thinking comes in. So it's not it's not either or and making rebuttals. It's a question of how you can get the best of both, and you can be much more targeted doing it. I want to I want to ground it in something that Stacy said and something that Wendy said. Wendy, I think we are creating nuggets here, but they're different kinds of nuggets and from different perspectives about our 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 individual. I, I'm not hearing much collective sense making. I'm hearing everyone giving their own worldview of sense making and whatever, but it's not a, a collective sense making. So if we're going to if we're going to evolve, then we're going to have to evolve to some sort of collective sense making. 
And I don't see very many good examples of that. Now then, coming back to what you were saying, Stacey, about uh, your experience, what it reminded me of was a session that I, uh, that I, when I was on a Zoom call, which was on Focus for Democracy, and there were presentations there given by Working Families, uh, uh, an organization that has a dual function. It has the traditional nonprofit uh, status, and also it has a um, partisan piece. And what they do is somewhat similar to what you just described. They go in and they find out, they, you know, the nonprofit goes in, they find out what do you need, so what do you need, whatever, how, you know, understanding your immediate needs and your will do. So once they understand that, then they deploy, it's really quite um, clever, then they use the partisan aspect, which is, you know, pre uh, 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 money that's been taxed to be able to go in and give them the facts. So one of the things that's come out of the preliminary information so far is most people don't understand what the impact of tariffs is going to be on the economy. No idea. You know, they don't even get it. So, I mean, there's a perfect example of a fundamental flaw in education in understanding the alleged policies that people, and the same thing with the mass deportation. It's just a frigging joke if you look at the report that came out on how impractical it is. It's gonna happen, it's gonna terrorize people, it's gonna make people frightened. That's what fascism is all about. But I wanna uh, dovetail back to what you were saying, Jose. I, this is where I respectfully disagree. I'm afraid to say, I wish we could develop a, a functional system and just overlay it over our sociopathic political systems. Um, you know, That's where Buckminster Fuller's naivety is just beyond belief in terms of his political naivety. You just build a new paradigm and the, the other one was self-destruct. Oh, if that were the case, we would have long got rid of this. So, I mean, I just think we're underestimating the complexity of this and we're all coming in with our own individual sense-making worldviews. And it's not gonna work because we can't even agree amongst a collective sense-making about how we want to redesign the system away from its highly dysfunctional properties now, which is, owned by plutocracy it is the votes do not count money counts that's all that counts we're just pawns in a game and we don't even realize we're being sacrificed on a regular basis the system is rigged and represent us has been talking about this for a decade or more and look how little progress they've made we're in the truman show and rick is in the control booth i'm getting more and more frightened um Jose, then Stacy, then me. You keep pushing yourself off. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, your comments, Rick, because I think 250 years ago is exactly what, what you've just described. That the, the systems that were operating 250 years ago got completely rewritten over a period of, of 50 to 75 years, pretty much all around Europe and, and Americas. And it happened because a bunch of people had a bunch of new ideas and they were able to, impact, to implement them. Um, and I think the same thing can happen and needs to happen again. Um, I think we're at that level of change. I don't think we're at incremental levels of change. And... And I think if we keep thinking that the fighting of the current system and, and fighting it is going to fix it, I think that the, the system itself, the current system, benefits from all of that. That's part of the, 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 the principles by which it works, divide and conquer. And so the more we fight, the better we are at sticking where we're at. It's for us clear, to figure. If I could just quickly, talk, I'm not. I'm not suggesting. I'm saying both and. You have to create a paradigm that can constructively deconstruct the old paradigm. That that mm -hmm. means that we have to have clear sense making, a clear understanding of the problem of the psychopathology of our political system, and it has to be grounded on understanding of that to be able to design a system that could become functional. What was his name? King George. Mm. Right. Did anybody try to figure out how crazy he was or how screwed up that thing was? No, we just moved on because fighting fighting the king um, back then uh, would have meant that we're 
stuck in believing that the king actually has the power that he does. That yeah, but there's no, every, the, the, up till that point, yeah. we believe. If I may, I just want to jump on to, to uh, the point of sense-making. I think that knowledge, um, Antoine, Marc-Antoine, is, um, is only part of, the, of it. A knowledge system only gets us facts. And facts isn't everything. And I hear you. Uh, my sense is that we need to figure out not only how to get, not only to get um, facts, supposed facts, um, but also to understand that we are organisms that most of our decision-making is intuition. Hmm. That most of our behavior is local, locally re responsive, not what's happening in, at, at, you know, in Washington or anywhere else. If it's local and responsive, responding to what's happening locally to me, and yet I'm voting for what's happening in, in Washington or in Sacramento or God knows where, then we're, we're missing something. There's something mm -hmm. missing. How do we build systems? And I agree with the premise that we need to build systems that help us in this area, but they're not, they're not single pole. We need to do both the, the knowledge aspect, the cognitive aspect, but also the intuition, the, the, the sense-making at a sensory level, the local because those two things, I think, are what builds a holistic view of the world, not just a cognitive view of the world. Mm. I see. Yeah, so I want to share something personal, because you guys know me, but I consider myself pretty good at being able to like put my feelings aside and act accordingly. And one of the things that I'm really struggling with now is I think I could be most useful in my community if I were to join with the MAGAs and to help devise some sort of plan for how we're going to address these mass deportations. Because what's happening where I am is not anything like what's happening here. Here, my friend says, oh, that's not going to happen. And she's right. It's not. Because here, the migrants that come, the church embraces them and feeds them and clothes them, and they need them to do their work. It's a whole different thing. Where I am, they have vilified them, they see them all the same, and there are some really nasty people that had been baked into what we call MAGAs, even though there are some really good people. That being said, it's a struggle. I'm like, all right, I can do this. Like I'm I'm going through like these levels of emotional changes, knowing that eventually I'm going to get there. But what I want to say is that it's not easy. And most people are not going to do that unless they're incentivized in some way to do that. Um, taking it down a notch or something that's easier for me is getting behind the idea of Robert Kennedy leading some positive changes. Because as much as I don't particularly like the person, the things that he's saying make sense. And I think that they can unite a lot of people from different sides of the political equation to do it. What I point out to the people on the other side is, what makes you think that if he's trying to do this, and another friend with big bucks comes in and says, no, we don't want you to do it. What makes you think they're going to do it Bobby's way? But that's when we need this, the, this mob mentality to be pushing for that as well. So I'm kind of glad that Bobby or Tulsi or those people are there. As angry as I might be at them for going there, maybe there's hope to... Re, redistribute the different types of people and mm. opinions in a way that works better. But on an mm. individual level, locally, 
It's not going to be easy. We need, I think, we need some sort of outside contest, <laughs> something to motivate people. And people are motivated by attention. So again, Jerry, you know, I've been talking about certain things for years, and this is sort of where it comes in. <laughs> Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. Um, let me go in. I think we have a couple other people who would like to jump in. Uh, two things, and they were more relevant a little while ago, but um, one is that when I said earlier that I'm trying to write like this, that I'm trying to write nuggets like this, that's kind of what I mean, is that the point of view I expressed, I'm trying to figure out how do you express that as a neobook, um, mm -hmm. rather than how do I write a screed about how stupid and ignorant the right is or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I'm trying to adapt and soften my stance and understand different points of view into this crazy, dramatic, important thicket of issues. Um, and I don't know that I'll succeed, but I'm trying, I'm trying to do that. And then the second thing is um, I've been involved in a couple of reconstitutional convention meetings. One of them hosted by Jake Dunnigan when he was at IFTF. I think he's back at IFTF now. But a couple of years ago, uh, Tom Attlee uh, and a whole bunch of really um, Jim, well, I've forgotten his name, who was uh, Jake's mentor at University of Hawaii uh, and has a whole model about this stuff. A lot of people came together to try to think, figure out, like, can we write a new constitution? And I did not walk away with any kind of blueprint or even hints of a plan, to borrow a phrase, um, that this might actually work well. I'm really, really, really interested in what an infrastructure and a set of dynamics might look like that lead us to rethinking how we self-govern. That's why I've been hosting these calls on, on these topics. I, I, I care a lot and I, I'm not sure we're getting anywhere, but I think right here we're digging in very fertile soil somehow. Hmm. What, what's, if I may. Hmm. It's clear to me that at this point, okay, I don't know what's clear. We'll be dealing, as I said, with the traditional structures of power and law, and people will be trying to do their autonomous thing and, and, and find their own better solutions as small groups. I mean, a lot of the, I've been extremely dismissive of crypto, but there's a lot of people in the DAO world who are thinking about how can we self-organize? And that is honorable. Um, the, the question of what I've been thinking about when I think about knowledge, uh, and yes, I know it's not as emotional, it's more cognitive, but it's about patterns, right? People have incomplete pictures and trying to do systems that say, here's your incomplete picture, here's a body of established what people have done before, and can we find the connections to help you uh, connect it and shape it and so that you can find what, what's the pattern here and what should you apply. And yes, that's the simple case, but it's in, in the Cunningham system, but it's a bit more than simple because you don't, it, it's not that easy to classify. So you're trying to find, okay, how do I interpret this in terms of what I, not only what I already know, but what we already know, which is very different. Um, and I think this is part of the picture of collective self-organization. It's trying to say, I want to do this. Who else wants to do things that could dovetail into it, into something bigger? And for me, that's governance. It's pattern finding, not so much laws, which was the old pattern we had because there weren't that many at the beginning. Uh, there were cognitive limits to how many laws could exist. But now bureaucracy has enabled us to create these lots of laws, which all of which are scar tissue, right? Something happened, let's patch it with a law. And, and, and trying to think more in terms of, in a way, case law, uh, trying to say, uh, well, what is this making thing of? Uh, what, what, is, what is this making me think of? What are the goals? what happened in previous cases and make it more close to past experience, but synthesize in a way that it can be useful to all, make the past experience a true comments. That's my hope of 
where the knowledge platform should go eventually. And in a way to enable more um, experimentation. And that's what a lot of people are complaining about bureaucracy, right? The, the, the laws become a dead weight. On the other hand, we do want laws and regulations. I mean, when people refute laws and regulation, I mean, that's how you get externalities and climate change. So, the, 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 and, and people obviously don't understand how a certain action will lead to that. And again, a knowledge platform should help them see, well, the reason that this particular action is problematic is because here's the long-term consequence, and let's see how we can adjust the action to make it more compatible with thrivability. And let's not think of you can do that, but let's think how can you do it differently. And this is where, again, a more dialogic um, relationship with regulations could be extremely useful. Uh, will that help us against plutocracy? No, it's not enough. But it also needs to be there. We need to be creating as well as, yes, we need to fight the, the, the plutocracy. It also is there. But we'll fight it better if we have better ways to self-organize also. Over. We have a lot of people and only a little bit of time. I kind of need to boogie at the top of the hour. So Rick, off to you. Uh, well, then I'll be very brief. Uh, it's been a, a very lively discussion. And I think, as we all know, we're just scratching the surface. And I think the issue of governance is one of the key things. Um, you know, you have to take my medical background into uh, consideration because just being solution focused is incredibly naive if you don't understand the problem, the psychopathology and everything else. So you have to have it grounded. You have to have a grounding of what's been going on in the past, what's affecting the future, and how can you design the future. And, and, and those things should not be reductionistic. They're all intermingled in, in terms of how we actually try and do collective sense making of our past, present, and future until we come together. Now, one thing that I think we're not very good at is we're not bringing very good at bringing networks of organizations together in aligned fashion. That to me is where the secret source could lie. And I'll just mention two things mm -hmm. very briefly. Aaron Hurst, you know, the author of uh, the um, Purpose Economy, has just established an organization called the U.S. Chamber of Connection. And the idea feeds into a little bit of um, join and die notion of developing social capital. You know, how can we how can we begin to, to rekindle that? But coming back to the issue of governance, and, and then I had a conversation with somebody who from the American future, somebody I met 10 years ago and just had a half hour chat with her. And uh, one of the take home messages that we're so focused on individual freedom, that's, which is which is the American brand, you know, is highly problematic. And nobody talks about it because nobody talks about fairness or equity. And that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in equity meta governance as something that can help manage the polarity between freedom and fairness to be able to create middle ground to build a better future. Thanks, Rick. Stacy. Well, I feel silly saying this, but it's been on my mind a lot. Um, it, it, I just keep wondering, could we even just create a pledge? Like, I mean, I know the right's done that, but, but just a pledge, just to, you know, we talk about like organizing, not rules or regulations, just a pledge. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Stacey. What was your say? I think Wendy dropped off. She was ahead of me, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, I keep on, maybe it's just, um, maybe it's just that I've been in lots of these community conversations, but this individualism thing I think is really important. I mean, I'm in one place, I've got these sets of things that I see as problems um, and these are the solutions and everything just pulls. So I'm going to start to read this book um, again. I got it from the States, ironically, Individualism mm. and World Politics. Girard is the editor. And I think I just need to get better at where is the takeout point from that? Where can I come off a wheel that is about Wendy and Wendy's place because I can't avoid that but have this other wheel spinning where I'm not lost because I know how I fit with the other wheel. And eventually, you know, James Cass, Finite and Infinite Games, my job is actually to do myself out of a job and to, to leave with grace if that makes sense. And that's hard because our egos won't let us do it, but you have to do it. <laughs> 
and living forever and sucking up all the resources isn't the answer for everybody else. So, <laughs> yeah. So services, service and living living in, in, in a way that's both finite and infinite, I think, is the grace, but it's really hard to do. Sounds good. Uh, Stacey, is your hand up from earlier or did you want to talk no, about it? I'm sorry. I thought I put it down. All right. Thank you. I think we... Was it was... Uh, yeah, I was just going to... Um, if, if we figure out how to communicate in a way that actually helps us not be in reaction to everything that's going on around us, but thinking about the things that we need to Wendy's point and how do we move from us to the, to the larger rather than from the larger to us. Because the, the us we're pretty good at. Most of us, most of us are not, you know, in fisticuffs with everybody around us, right? And no. yet, and yet we we get together and we can't congeal. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe we need fisticuffs. Pardon me? Maybe we need fisticuffs. No, I, I think. I think that the reality is that we have different worldviews and our world, our local worldview is very both time and space centered. And then when we come together and try to figure out how to, how to, how to see the world the same, we can't because we're very different for a reason. Because we're in different places at different times, doing different things, and and that's good. We can't. That's we're just not going to change that. No. But if instead of trying to sort of reduce everybody to a, a you know a single answer to everything to everybody, hey, you know what? There are problems with too many people and running into the country, and that's going to accelerate with with global warming. And yeah, there's lots and lots of problems with people on the street and not having housing. Here in San Francisco, it's ridiculous. Um, and we're not solving that. Um, and we're not solving the fact that most of them have mental health issues. We're not solving the fact that most of them have sustenance abuse. And, you know, those are all realities. And we could, we could say they, they're not real, but they are. And physically, I know that to be real here locally. Now, maybe I'm, I'm in some other city or town where that's not real. Maybe it's not as big an issue. But if we focus on what's real locally and what we feel and sense and have to respond and react to, then I think we, someone else can't argue with what I feel and sense when I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with in my local community. And if that moves towards a global governance system that is locally based rather than centralized, then I think that to me makes more sense. And today, unlike any other time in human history, it's viable, it's possible. No other time in human history would we have been able to abstract local decisions into global systems. That is a local maximum of emotional content that I really like. And uh, I need to melt this call, I'm afraid, and make my <laughs> way back to, back to the US. Um, but oh, you are coming back. We, we thought you were leaving. Hey, you know, we rolled the dice. We're like, wait, wait, can we run away, run away to Montreal? And maybe next time. Um, guys, thank you so much. This was this was uh, lovely, and uh, I hope everybody sleeps really well despite this conversation. Or maybe yeah, can. I'm off to Milan tomorrow, so I won't sleep oh, well. Wow. Cool. Yeah. So, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, guys. Bye. Yep. Bye. Ciao.